Welcome to Sports Center Flashback. I'm Reese Davis. It was a sustained excellence that hadn't been equaled in the NBA since the Boston Celtics of the 1960s. The Chicago Bulls owned the 1990s, winning six championships in a blistering eight-year run. But after their last dance in the spring of 1998, the Bulls came apart. As we'll see in the next half hour, the cracks in the dynasty had been deepening for years. to Scotty Pippen, and if somebody asked Scotty, what do you think the legacy of this team is going to be? The smile that was on his face just totally disappeared, and he said, all they're going to remember is that Michael won. None of them ever really felt like they got their proper due. That really explains a lot when you look at why that team broke up. Is there somebody to blame? Well, obviously, it has to be somebody's fault that that kind of team could not stay together and give it a shot for another championship. Jerry Krause has his ego. The owner has his ego. Jackson has his ego. Jordan has his ego. Michael wanted the power. Phil wanted the power. Krause had the power. Yeah, I don't think Reinsdorf knew much about basketball, and I think Krause was his basketball brain. And given those circumstances, I think he couldn't do anything but give Krause all the say and all the power as far as the basketball went. And the only real decisions, of course, that I made were to get people who knew what they were doing so I could stand out of the way and let them get their jobs done. The struggle for all that power began in March of 1985 when Jerry Reinsdorf, the new owner of the Bulls, hired Jerry Krause. By the next season, the new vice president of basketball operations and the star player were at each other's throats. Very early in Michael's second season with the team, of course, he injured his foot, and that was Krause's first full season as general manager and that entire scenario just created the nightmare that would become the jordan kraus relationship we sent michael to three specialists around the country and all three of them told me that uh, there was a probably an 80 90 percent chance he could get re-injured i didn't want to send him out there i i kept listening to doctors doctors kept telling me not to send him out there michael was wanted to play more and that's the kind of competitor he is they go to these meetings with the doctors jordan had said what the doctors said and it wasn't what the team said so next time the crowd shows up with a tape recorder and jordan had gotten furious about this he said he, you know in effect implied he didn't believe him so then they have another session and now jordan shows up with a tape recorder and he says i want to tape kraus because he's lying they just don't want me to play because they want to miss the playoffs again they want to get a high draft pick it just got worse from there jerry kraus uh, according to Michael, stepped in and said, you'll do as we say, you're our property. And Michael, years later, remembered that as saying, that was when I knew I was in a business. I tried to be as sensitive as I could to Michael. By the same token, I had a responsibility to our franchise and to the people that were paying me. And it's probably the most difficult situation I've gone through. Like most head-on collisions, Michael won. He played. Michael was still immature, so I don't know necessarily that he was fair. I felt like Michael made a mistake to come back, and he could have jeopardized not only the franchise future, uh, but his own future. Jordan propelled the Bulls into the playoffs, where he scored an NBA postseason record 63 points against the Celtics. But the acrimony between player and VP increased two years later when Krause traded Jordan's friend Charles Oakley for center Bill Cartwright. I told Michael we would inform him of everything we were doing, which he deserved. He was at a fight that night uh, in Vegas, the night we made the trade. And I couldn't get to him. And the trade was announced, and he got a little excited. And, and that's fine. He didn't understand Bill, didn't know Bill. We thought that that trade could turn us into a champion. And uh, luckily enough, uh, it worked out that way. But even a championship, followed by another one, and then a third, couldn't heal the rift between Jordan and Krauss. Michael wondered, why is this short guy, the general manager of the Chicago Bulls, to dictate what we ought to be doing? I think he just had a kind of a, a resentment. 
do, did feel the jury was trying to take a little bit more credit probably than he deserved. Jerry believes he never got enough credit uh, as a scout for finding talent, and nobody ever knew who Jerry Krause was before he became a general manager. And I think once in that position, he decided, well, now it's time, it's my time. Jerry, with all of his tales, loves to regale people about his scouting accomplishments and how he stood up to get Sloan and, and Earl the Pearl Monroe, who were not household names, but tales like that would just set Michael Jordan off. Michael began making fun of him more and more in front of the media. And then it started getting meaner, and you wondered where it came from. It was stuff like Scottie Pippen, very innocently, after the first title, seeing a replica of the NBA trophy on Jerry's desk and admiring it and asking if he could get one made. And Jerry saying, absolutely not. That's only for the captains. You know, and then later bragging uh, to me about it that, you know, he wouldn't let Scottie do it. I mean, why? the personal insecurities that Jerry sometimes has, his ability to irritate people, to be brusque, as Phil said, all of those things factor in. He alienated so many people. I mean, he just has such a horrible way about him that it's always easy to say he brought it on himself, but he doesn't know how to behave any differently. One day we were on the bus, and Michael said from the back of the bus, Jerry, you, you can go fishing tomorrow. They got a lot of lakes out here. He said, don't, don't worry about it if you don't catch anything. You can always eat the bait. <laughs> so everybody on the bus was like laughing. Jordan would be at the back going, Jerry Krause, Jerry Krause, this bus went a lot faster yesterday without your fat ass on it. I'm not one to criticize somebody who's paying me pretty well to, uh, to play or coach basketball. I think it's silly. I think it's silly, and I think it's a waste of energy. If I'm the owner, I'm getting in the middle and saying, Michael, would you stop the crap here? Reinsdorf never did that. He allowed all this to fester. The one person who might have been able to keep the dynasty together was not Michael Jordan. It was Phil Jackson. If Jackson had decided to come back, Jordan would have played for him. Michael Jordan had developed an affinity for Phil Jackson, who was promoted to head coach in 1989. Jackson created a unity between the players, insulating and isolating them from everything but the task at hand. The team that Phil Jackson took over, it was besieged with hangers on. Michael Jordan's own entourage was many in number. Phil Jackson stepped in and put curtains up at practice, and he began walling off all of the outside world. The way that a team kind of bonds together and plays for each other, I think that's the one thing that uh, I've had as a coach with the Bulls. One common binding element he found was that they all had this resentment on some level about something toward Kraus. And he said, well, maybe we can use that. Phil was very, very good at getting the players to stand in their chain, in their circle, they used to call it. it kind of an us against everybody else. At times, you know, management was on the outside of that circle. Phil was motivating the team, and it's a great ploy. It's us against them, and it was the players against management. And Phil was using that to motivate him, and it worked. Phil had his ways of doing things. Uh, he was very successful with them. Uh, I just leave it at that. Jerry got to the point where he felt like the field was undermining him, but at the same time, I do feel like Phil maybe could have been a little bit more supportive of Jerry as far as the team was concerned. The idea that Phil could have done more, I would not agree with. His job is to win basketball games. And so, again, if you're talking about sides of the fence to fall on, I think that it was appropriate that if he and Michael fell on the same side of the fence. That is the most important thing to Phil is the fact that he wanted their trust. He wanted them to know that these 12, 13, 14 players in this coaching staff, this is the group. By being excluded, Krauss felt he had been betrayed by an ungrateful man. After all, he was the one who had betrayed by an ungrateful man. He was the one who had rescued Jackson from the coaching scrap heap, selecting him as a Bulls assistant in 1987. Phil Jackson was working in Albany, New York with the Patroons. Sometimes he would drive his team two games when he was in the CBA. I mean, Phil was uh, down low in coaching. 
If not for Kraus, Phil's out of the league. He's, he's done with the NBA. I mean, no one was hiring him. No one's giving him interviews. So now Kraus felt some resentment because here was, you know, Phil becoming another star. Like everybody's becoming a star but him. <laughs> When you win championships, you're in a position as a head coach to feel that you ought to have a little bit more say about personnel. I don't think Phil Jackson was ever interested in Jerry Krause's job as general manager, but uh, it was a power struggle to the extent that, that uh, Phil wanted a little more say on a lot of things and that uh, Jerry Krause just didn't want to yield. He didn't want Phil to get any ideas that he might be uh, general manager material. And so Jerry would purposely keep him out of discussions. And so it was insulting. I mean, there was a lot of ego involved. Jerry Krause, that summer before the 98 season, had had a wedding party for his daughter and had not invited Phil Jackson, but had invited Tim Floyd at that point, the coach at Iowa State, that everybody had basically shooed into the job of being the next Phil Jackson. So it was a blatant, overt snub. And Phil said he marched right in on Monday morning and said, I've had enough of this. By common agreement, the management of the Bulls and I, Jerry Krause and I had agreed that this would be indeed my last year. Jerry Krause did was it seemed destined to be fodder for Michael Jordan's motivation but it, it really reached a high in the fall of 97 on press day Krause said I don't care if we go 82 and 0 Phil's not coming back that statement was very indicative of how their relationship was at that time only an angry man would say something like that Krause could have stayed up in his office that day but he came down into the Birdo Center where there were just numbers of camera crews and he said it's not just players who win championships organizations do without the word alone and it would have been an arrogant statement to make but the statement I made was alone I said players and coaches alone don't win and that's true and I believe that to this day I'll believe it all my life I think you have to have an organization that wins our secretaries in the office get rings they get the same rings that everybody else gets that's a heck of a comment to make when you know we've got guys in the trenches every single day and practice and every single night in these games that are doing it secretaries and stuff aren't out there making big shots that was a slap to the players on that team and I think Michael took that very very hard. It's a bad way to end an uh, unbelievable run. Michael reiterated that this will be his final season if Phil Jackson doesn't come back. We came to a conclusion as a basketball team that we probably couldn't go on any farther as a group. I named the season by chance or by more than chance the last dance before the season started we got the uh, book with all the rules all the traveling uh, everything that's that's gonna be going on that year and the title of the book was the last dance Phil in our first team meeting really told us to enjoy it and to go through it and, and take a look around while it's going on and enjoy it because it's not gonna happen for a long time Michael and Scotty, they were still childlike in their susceptibility to that sort of us against management. So Phil beat that drum throughout that 98 season, which clearly was going to be his last, his last dance. Today in the Sun-Times, you were quoted as saying that uh, perhaps they should replace Jerry Krause as the GM and hire Phil Jackson. I like to see Phil be general manager and head coach. It was coming from their meetings, obviously, where Phil was really having a lot of fun with this. What befuddles me about the Reinsdorf ownership is that all of this was going on beneath him here. And he always sat back and said, no, nope, this is Krause's baby. Speculation that Jerry Krause had anointed Tim Floyd as Bill Jackson's successor intensified during the first round of the 1998 playoffs when Dean Kleinschmidt was approached about becoming the Bulls' trainer. Within the past couple of weeks, Tim Floyd, the head coach of Iowa State, has been in contact with the head trainer of the New Orleans Saints, Dean Kleinschmidt.
Well, how in the world could Jerry Krause and Tim Floyd let this thing be known and then Krause issuing a statement? No, that's never going to happen. There was just something about Krause that, that you could not trust. Tim and I were friends at that point, and uh, we certainly had had conversations uh, regarding his desire to coach in the NBA, but I had not offered him a job. I knew uh, Dean Kleinschmidt originally through Jim Finks. If you've got a problem, you go to the best in that field and, and ask him about the rest of the best in his field. Dean himself and I had spoken, and, and uh, I think, actually, Jerry was just trying to be thorough. That conversation could have probably happened with Dean at a later time and it'd been a big deal. I thought it was, you know, disrespectful to hear Tim Floyd's name being brought up while Phil would have to open the paper or whatever to, to hear about this stuff. I remember Michael rolling his eyes and off the record he would say, no matter how much they deny it, that they were breaking up the Bulls. the end of the season, uh, the ownership still offered me a job. Jerry Cross and I basically had agreement that we got on far enough with each other. Phil really was having all kinds of trouble in his personal relationships at home. He was exhausted and was facing a situation where he couldn't come back. And this was our last dance, and it was a wonderful ball. Thank you all. Michael felt perhaps a bit deceived. He's implied that a couple of times. He, he went to bat for Phil, and at the end, he was stunned when Ryan sort of said, bring back what you want. Phil hopped on his motorcycle and rode off in the sunset. Michael and I kind of distanced each other from what we had to do in our careers at the end of the season. I said, you should make this decision on your own. And he said, let's leave it at that. I will make the decision on my own. But there's, your retirement obviously has a lot to do with how I feel about the game. As the NBA lockout dragged on and the 1998-99 season was delayed, Jackson insisted he wouldn't return. And Jordan reiterated that he would only play for his championship coach. Management continued to leave the door open for everyone. I've said over and over again that I wanted to bring back the players and the coach who won the 1998 championship. Should Phil not return by the end of the lockout, Tim will succeed him as head coach of the Chicago Bulls. I think it would have been a bad thing for us to announce that Tim was the new head coach and then the perception was Michael retired because he got forced out. We tried to leave it up to Michael. I know. They forced Michael out of here. You do not hire coaches a year before or say he's going to replace a coach. And to sit there and have a press conference and we welcome you back if Phil wants to come back and all these particular things is just to let the whole public know, well, we tried to get him back here. You don't do that. I know that Michael checked with Roy Williams, and I know he checked with Carolina people, and I know he found out Tim Floyd was a pretty good coach. He called and he said, don't worry about the coach. I'll make this decision no matter who the coach is. It wasn't that Michael loved Phil so much that he was going to go down with the ship. He hated Kraus so much that Michael was willing to place his principles on the table and say, I, I just, I won't play anymore if you fire my coach or run him out of town. He had this insatiable desire to still play basketball. He hopes that it turns around, that at some point they can work it out and Phil will stay there. And he really held tight to that. And then, when it didn't happen, you know, that was probably the worst day of his career because then he was forced to retire. If Michael Jordan had not retired, I don't have any doubt in my mind that, that, that we would have had an awfully good chance of winning another championship. But once Michael retired, we talked about what we were going to do. Can we bring the rest of this group back and, and win with it? And it was an easy decision for me, and the answer was no. In a tumultuous two-week period in January of 1999, Reinsdorf and Krauss dismantled the championship Bulls. Jordan retired. Free agent Scotty Pippen was re-signed and traded to Houston. Steve Kerr and Luke Longley were traded, and Dennis Rodman declared himself done with basketball. It's the time. And how many W's in Drew? We'll ask him flat out how much he can improve last year's three and thirteen bill. Sports Center, sixty.
Jerry Reinsdorf and Jerry Krause were sick and tired of being portrayed as riding number 23's coattails. They thought they had earned the right to start it over and build it in their or Jerry Krause's image. Jerry felt like he had something to prove to himself that he could do it. I think that he relished that challenge and wanted it. I think people thought I relished it more than I actually did. At that time, I wasn't about ready to quit and go home. And the first day of training camp started with us having four players. We had players coming from all parts of the United States that had to go through physicals and sign contracts. We didn't have enough players to open camp. The ones mighty Bulls were laughed at now. The team were going out to the Bulls because of those days they were just actually uh, still pissed and miserable for, for the things the Bulls did to them. The Bulls setting a new record for offensive utility. I remember us playing Miami Heat and scoring 59 points in a game. I remember players running by our bench. Where is Michael and Scotty now? After losing 102 games and winning only 30 in the first two years without MJ and the Jordanaires, the Bulls thought they had lined up their savior in the summer of 2000, the extraordinarily talented Tracy McGrady, then a free agent. I think the saddest moment I've had in, uh, in many years uh, was when Tracy told me no. Uh, he had indicated to us that he was coming, uh, and it was a very tough moment for me. If I was the outsider, not knowing what is going on, and if I hear all these stories, I would say, I'm not going there. If Michael is not happy in there, I'm not going to be happy at all. If they crapped on the best player to ever play the game, then why would I want to go there? I just feel like Chicago, the management there, is, is all about them. And unfortunately, the players want to win this championships, not management. If Jordan couldn't help the Bulls on the court, couldn't he have served them off the court? Apparently, no attempt was even made at reconciliation. The sports crime of the century is that Michael didn't finish out his playing career in Chicago and then gracefully segue into the front office. If anything was going to happen in Chicago, Jerry Reinsdorf would have had to got in touch with Michael and presented an opportunity. What Michael Jordan wanted was a piece of the franchise. He wanted to be ahead of Krause in the hierarchy. Ownership level was never discussed. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I don't think my job was discussed, and that's the way it is. One admirable quality in Reinsdorf, although it probably did not do the Bulls organization very much good, he's a loyal guy, and he believes that Jerry Krause did a lot to build that dynasty. He's not going to just cast him aside, not even for Michael Jordan. Why does he stay loyal to Jerry Krause? Krause has taken his bullets for him over the years because Jerry Reinsdorf very shrewdly has stayed out of the crossfire. And now, Jerry Krause, I hate to use this word, and I don't use it lightly, but he will go down as the most hated man in the history of Chicago sports, which is exactly what he didn't want. In 1996, with a fourth championship in hand, Jerry Reinsdorf signed Michael Jordan to a one-year contract for a record $30 million. According to Jordan, the Bulls owner said, quote, at some point in time, I know I'm going to regret what we just did, end quote. Having been grievously underpaid his entire career and having turned the franchise into a cash cow, Jordan was incensed. He saw it as disrespect. And from there, the bitterness would only grow. For SportsCenter Flashback, I'm Reese Davis.